Hi, my name is Janelle Clampett and I'm a graduate research student studying at Auburn University and today I'm going to talk to you about how enhancing the hydraulic performance of wattles can help improve erosion and sediment control practices. Now this is a pretty quick presentation, it's going to be under 15 minutes. I did give this at the Alabama Water Resource Conference in Orange Beach in September of 2022. Now, if you weren't able to either make it to my presentation or the conference itself, hopefully we can get you all caught up here. Let's start off with why this is important. Well, on the screen, you can see the water quality results for the state of Alabama for 2022, broken up into the different water bodies. And you can see when we start off in our smaller water bodies or rivers and streams, we have about 25% of that water being categorized as impaired. Now that is a minimum because over 37% of that water, we don't have enough data on to know where it fits on the spectrum. So a minimum of 25%. And then by the time we get down to our, our coastal areas, we have over 98% of that water being categorized as impaired. Now the data that you saw on the previous slide is from the 303D list. If you're not familiar with what that is, then on the screen you can see the list of various pollutants that if found in water can qualify a water body as being listed as impaired. The pollutant I'm going to talk to you about today is sediment. Sediment itself is a pollutant because if mixed in water, it can do things like block sunlight, which can have a chain of negative environmental impacts. However, other chemicals are typically bound to sediment particles, bringing about a toxic component. Now, one major contributor to sediment-laden water is construction activities. And as of 2021, the US economy spent over $1.5 trillion on construction activities alone. And if you're wondering, well, how do construction activities compare to crops or forests? Well, studies have been done to answer that question. We have found that anywhere between 20 to 200 tons per acre per year of sediment is lost on construction sites. That's a huge range, simply because it's very site-based. Now, when you look at crops, you have about 5.4 tons per acre per year and less than 0.5 for forests. So that's why we care so much about focusing on our construction sites, on keeping the sediment on the site and not in our water. Now today I'm going to talk to you specifically about how wattles can help minimize that soil loss on construction sites. If you don't know what a wattle is, you've likely seen them before, just not known what they were. So on the screen, you can see a photo of a bunch of different wattles. They're simply just cylindrical tubes that can be filled with the various different types of fill material. They're a popular practice in erosion and sediment control because you can put them on slopes or channels. They're lightweight, easy to install, and most importantly, they're cheap relatively speaking. Um, but when I talk about a ditch check, I'm talking specifically about a channel application that is looking to minimize that shear force that's causing erosion. So how do you evaluate a wattle? Well, fiscally speaking, when you invest in a product, you want to make sure to get the most out of that product. And what that would look like here is having water over top the wattle. Overtopping the wattle means you're getting the maximum height and usage out of that product. Hydraulically speaking, we want to have water overtop that wattle because we're holding back as much water as possible and creating that subcritical flow by increasing impoundment depth and length. Subcritical flow is really important because it's a greater depth of water and it forces supercritical, so super fast and shallow water that's causing the erosion, it forces that to slow down and it allows sediment particles a chance to settle out of suspension, minimizing the erosion. So how are wattles installed? Well, in the past, we used to just take a wattle and drive a stake right through it. And what would end up happening is when water would come, it would essentially lift that wattle up, undermine, and then cause downstream scour. And this is what that installation would look like, where you can see that undermining that's occurring right at the middle of that wattle there, and then we have that downstream scour. So we're not really, we're implementing the product, but we're not really getting the purpose or the use out of it because we still have that erosion, which is what we're trying to prevent happening. So, studies have looked into how can you change the installation to make sure that we're getting the most out of that product. And what that essentially would look like was if you took a geotextile underlay and trenched it upstream, and then you staked that down, then you took your wattle and did a non-destructive TP staking pattern, so you're not damaging the wattle itself, 
but you're holding it to the ground. And then you put stakes underneath that wattle to help anchor it to the ground and maintain that intimate contact so water can't go underneath it. So now what would happen is when water would come, it can't undercut that geotextile because we've trenched it and anchored it down. And it's not going underneath the wattle because we've really made sure that that's anchored down as well. So now water is forced to flow through and over top of the wattle. And we have studies that have shown a 95% increase in the subcritical impoundment length and over a thousand percent increase in sediment retention just by changing the installation method. And this is what that installation would look like. After these results were published, the Alabama Department of Transportation then implemented these installation methods into their standards. And you can also find it in the Alabama handbook. So we've looked at how to evaluate a wattle and how to install it to make sure that we're getting the most out of the product. But what about the product itself? If you remember previously, I told you that wattles can be filled with various different types of fill material. Well, studies have looked into a bunch of those fill materials, and the most popular ones are wheat straw, excelsior wood fiber, coconut coir, miscanthus fiber, wood chips, and recycled carpet fiber. Now that study took the wattles with the various different types of fill materials and placed them in a controlled setting. In this case, it was a four foot wide flume. And this is what that insulation looked like inside that flume. Now, before I jump ahead and show you the results, I'm gonna walk you through how to interpret and how to read these length and depth ratio plots. Now, previously, if you remember, we talked to you about how to evaluate a wattle and how we want water to overtop it. Well, these plots are based on a length and depth ratio. So essentially we took the height of the wattle and how much water it's capable of impounding versus how much it did impound. So as I mentioned previously, we want water overtopping that wattle. So we want 100% of that depth. So anything above 100% means we have water flowing over top. And we want at least 80% for our length impoundment. 80%, not 100, because we have a hydraulic jump in there that's going to take a little bit of that out. So this creates what we call a performance target window, which is this little gray box. And any of the data points that you see in that gray box is good. It means we're getting the most out of that product. So now when we come back and we look at the results, you can see the average for everything except the wheat straw and the excelsior made it into that performance target window. So our next question was, well, we looked at the inside of a wattle. What about the outside? Is there a way that we can improve the impoundment abilities of a product that might not be where we want it to be? So for the next study, we selected Excelsior as our fill material because we wanted to see if we could bring these data points into that performance target window. And we, and we did this by changing the encasements. Now this was a study that I most recently did where we broke it up into two portions to where we evaluated the fabrics independent of the fill material, and then we took the best performing fabrics and then implemented that with the Excelsior fill material with it and see how that performed. So this is just kind of a fun slide to where you can see the black space is the percent open area and um, of the various different types of fabrics that were evaluated, and you can kind of also see the different weaving styles that came with that. So the fabric portion of it was evaluated in a much smaller flume. This one's about one foot wide. And this is what that installation would look like where we measured the impoundment length and the depth. And these are the results from the, from the fabric portion of this analysis. And you can see that our cotton was actually our highest impounding fabric. So we decided to double and triple layer that. And that's what that D and T stands for at the end of those codes. And essentially, for this next portion, we then selected the best performing cotton, polypropylene, polyester, polypropylene mix, and bamboo cotton mix was neglected due to supply issues. But out of those three, we decided to take those and implement that into the wattle portion. Additionally, we did the triple layer cotton to see how that would perform as well. So after we made these different wattles with various encasement, types, we then tested that in that same hydraulic four foot flume so that we can directly compare the results. And here are the results. You can see that this time we decided to break up the results for high flow and low flow conditions 
because there was a distinctive dis difference between the two. So in the high flow conditions, we weren't we were just outside of that performance target window, but not quite where we want it to be. So we were looking more so if we could improve this low flow situation and bring that up so that the waddle is performing equally in different types of situations. And we were successful with the triple layered cotton and a little bit with that single layered cotton, but not so much of the poly, polypropylene and the polyester polypropylene fabrics. Now this might make it a little bit easier to see. And again, you can see that this polypropylene fabric, we actually decreased in performance when compared to the control. This is a percent change plot. Um, but then when we come over and we look at our polyester polypropylene mix, we, we did improve, but not a ton. And then when we look at our cotton fabrics, we had a drastic increase in performance, most particular during our low flow situations, which again is what we were wanting to achieve. So now when we come back and we look at these length and depth ratio plots once more, we if we look at our triple layered cotton, again, we were just outside of that performance target window, so we were almost right where we wanted it to be. But um, when we compared it to our single layered cotton, we did not have enough significance in the data to justify the additional cost for that triple layered versus the single layered. And then when we look at this polypropylene fabric, the fact that we had a negative um, a negative difference from the control indicated that perhaps the materials made a difference. So overall, our single layered cotton fabric was our winner. And because it had the biggest change in improving the impoundment overall for high and low flow situations. Um, but additionally, it is cotton, so it's biodegradable and environmentally friendly. So it got an extra gold star for that. So in conclusion, for the encasements, we weren't able to correlate the percent open area with impoundment. However, when looking at the internal and external components of a waddle, we did find that material had the greatest impact in changing the impoundment. For future tests, we would like to conduct the same encasement evaluation, but have sediment introduction in there and see how that would impact the results. We'd also like to do evaluations by increasing or decreasing the density of the fill materials and then how the percent open area of the different fabrics change when it's saturated. And also look to see if we have other biodegradable materials that we can use for wattles. This concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Now I did cover a lot of material pretty quickly. But hopefully this presentation gave you a good understanding of how just small changes can make such a big impact for erosion and sediment control practices. But if you do happen to have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. It's included here on the slide. Or if you want to see what else I'm up to, you can check out my website. My QR code's right there. But also, if you want to see what else we got going on at our Auburn University Stormwater Research Facility, we have a QR code down below and you can check them out. We got some really cool projects going on as well. Thank you so much for watching again.